Traveling the Vortex. We've joined the Doctor's companions and they escape a madman's prison called episode 514. I'm Keith. I'm Sean. I'm Glenn. How are you guys? Pretty good. Feeling better, Sean? Well, uh, getting there, yeah. Had a COVID scare this past weekend and wound up in the ER. Fortunately, it was uh, just a sinus infection. Unfortunately, it was a sinus infection. <laughs> That's lingering, but uh, I don't sound like Barry White anymore, so that's a good, a good thing. Holly's been, uh, well, she was sick over the weekend, and she went and got tested as well, and she came back negative. Um, and she's just, she's got all kinds of just congestion in her head. She's been sneezing and coughing, and so she's probably got the same thing, just a sinus infection and run, good old run-of-the-mill yeah. cold. It hit me all of a sudden. I, I just, within a matter of like two hours, I went downhill from feeling fine to, I was doing the checklist going, oh no, oh no, oh no, no, no. <laughs> and I, I thought for sure I was going to lose my gold star for the pandemic. I just, oh, yeah. I, like, all, all the hard work that I'd put in on avoiding this stupid thing. <laughs> and uh, I, I just knew it. But uh, all the tests came back negative and I was like, okay, whew, dodged a bullet. This time. This time. <laughs> so far. Did you guys watch dun, anything dun, or dun. read anything or do anything in the last couple of weeks? Mel and I went out and uh, caught a matinee showing of Moonfall. Oh, a Roland Emmerich disaster flick. And I heard it's a disaster. It is so much a disaster and so much fun. Oh, is it? Did you have fun? It we did, and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna preface this by saying there is not a lick of science in this. <laughs> <laughs> There's it's it, it is it is epic levels of like you 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 have to go in this with a turn your brain off, check uh -huh. check your logic and physics at the door. Do not bring them into the theater because <laughs> there's there's no place for those in in this movie. It's just it's just just don't. No, we're we're not doing that here. Uh, and if you can if you can do that, I mean, if if you if you're bringing Neil deGrasse Tyson with you to the to the theater, you are not going to have a good time. I can just mm -hmm. I can assure you of that. But if you can if you can come and just expect to have an absolute blast watching disaster porn and things blow up and an absolutely ludicrous, um, you know. Yeah, it, it was it was an absurdly amount of fun. You are the only one that I've talked to or heard from that have liked it. <laughs> I, I will freely admit, I, I it's it's it is it is one of those simple minds, simple pleasures, <laughs> and it, it it pushed that button for me. Yeah. But I'll also admit that that Roland Emmerich he he has a he has a niche, and the man is is nefarious when it comes to you know. What are you going to do today, Roland? The same thing I do every day. I'm going to blow stuff up. And it just kind of is like, yeah, I'm all right with that. And you look at the track record, it's it's not, you know, it's not on the scale of Independence Day. It's probably closer to Independence Day resurgence. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm okay with that. It's it's just, he, he, he knows what I like. And I like to see things blow up in ridiculous fashion. And so I, <laughs> I had a good time. Patrick Wilson was fun and... Uh, things blew up. <laughs> I just, I can't reiterate that enough. Things blew up and I was happy. So, well, I kind of feel bad for him because the, I think I saw the budget was uh, $138 million and it made $10 million this weekend. Yeah. I think they spent more than the film's budget on advertising for it. And uh, I hadn't yeah, even seen, I, well. I didn't see, I hadn't seen any ads. I hadn't seen any advertising. I hadn't seen any trailers. And then, um, uh, I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about it and I thought, what is this? And so I, I got to look at it and started reading the reviews and stuff. And then a couple of guys at work had gone and saw it. And they absolutely said it was just trash. It's not, they said it's not even worth it. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that you liked it. It, 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 it is. 39% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. 39? It is, it is, yeah. It is schlocky B horror movie kind of levels of, you know. But I might like it then. <laughs> yeah, it's, the it, title it's, alone is 
It, it, oh, I know, it, right? Moonfall, you know. Just, uh, <laughs> and it it hits all the tropes. It's got uh, it, there there are no characters. It, it, it's just it's got tropes. You know, the the troubled son with the heart of gold, and the the astronaut who was banned from doing things because they threw the book at him for something that wasn't his fault. And the, yeah, it's got all of that in it. It's just I ate it up. <laughs> <laughs> It's more give me more and then the hook at the end for a possible sequel that's never going to happen i was like yeah give me more of this <laughs> put it in my eye holes i want more of this <laughs> we, were like only, we were the only time we were the only two in the well. theater <laughs> we we were the only two in the theater so it was <laughs> yeah keith what'd you say it looks like it's tied for uh, with 2012 in his rankings of movies. Uh, so if you enjoyed 2012, it's probably on the same par for you. <laughs> Although the audience score is higher. Yeah, I think I enjoyed this one more than 2012. Keith, I mean, did you... He, oh. doesn't really, no, he doesn't really get certified fresh movies anyways. Yeah, no. Not lately. <laughs> No, not, not ever. Not since Independence Day. <laughs> not not even Independence Day is certified for us. According is it to really? Tomatoes. I would have yeah. thought. Well, I get. I guess that's true. It's. I mean, it takes 68%. a lot. Sixty-eight percent. As I say, it takes a lot to get those. So. Keith, did you do? Or Sean, did you do anything else? Um. No, not really. That was kind of the highlight. Of the... <laughs> Keith, what that about was, you? That's about it. We watched Encanto. Ooh, what'd oh, you think? what did you think? I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. I can't remember. Didn't really pay that close of attention to it until the music came on, and <laughs> now, uh, it's all the music she wants to listen to. Oh, but, is that right? Yeah. I, I can't remember. Did we talk about this or not? Because we watched it a few weeks back, but I couldn't remember if I talked about it. I I enjoyed it. I thought it was a good movie, but I I, I don't think it was all the all that that everybody's making it out to be. No, it's it's. I think I feel like it's on par with the recent run. I haven't still haven't seen Ray and the Last Dragon, but I think it was not quite as good as Moana. Yeah, but agreed. everything else is just kind of on par with. Yeah, agreed. I think yeah. I, I, in fact, I think I liked even the last um, what Frozen Two uh, better than this. So, hmm. I think it's one of those that it, it's subtle. In, in a lot of ways. And because of the family dynamic that it's got going on, I think it's one of those that 10 years down the line, we're still going to be talking about Encanto. And I think it's one that's going to be taught. Like, I think there, there, will, there will legit be college-level classes taught about this film and all of the, um, the levels of, of subtlety that are going on in it because of the characters and, and their power sets and... The, the the songs and the levels of meaning in them um how the the you know the one strong girl is you know literally she can't say no to people and th i i just think there's a lot of stuff going on that we haven't really even scratched the surface yet with it and i i don't think i i think people are are latching on to that and that's why it's it's be blowing up and being such a thing and a lot of us haven't haven't really found that level with it, that, that level of connection, but it is hitting people on on some of those levels. Well, and I think there's a good point there, and along with the fact of because it is a, about a large family as opposed to, you know, Frozen's about a family too, but it's a very small, it's, it's sisters. Yeah. And this is a much more bigger, more complex family dynamic that more people can relate to, I think, as far as that goes. I did notice that the music... Um, you can definitely hear it now, after, especially after watching Tick, Tick, Boom, you can really see Jonathan Larson's influence on Lin-Manuel Miranda and on how he writes his music and lyrics. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But we don't talk about Bruno. Yes. We've been hearing that song a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that and Surface Pressure, the mm. Luis's song. Yeah. yeah. Sarah didn't like it as much as I did. Anything what else? about you, Glenn? Well, that's it for me. <laughs> I played. I see. I, my last two weeks was catching up to you guys. Um, I <laughs> I watched uh, all six episodes of Book of Boba Fett, or oh, or yeah. or Mandalorian season two point five. 
I'm um, still too behind. <laughs> Boba Fett, guest starring Boba Fett. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's you, it's how many behind are you, Sean? I am two. We will catch oh. up tomorrow. <laughs> two? I don't know. Oh, yeah, I'm surely you've been spoiled though on stuff because I I couldn't uh, even, yeah, I couldn't I, even I believe so. At this I point. couldn't even avoid it. It was just it was. Uh, in fact, that was part of the reason I decided to go ahead and launch in, and because I just kept I, I couldn't avoid spoilers for this thing, and I thought, okay, well, I better catch up. So at least I'm on the same page with everybody. Uh, but I'm thoroughly enjoying it. It's a blast. Um, I just I I'm one of those people, and I know people have kind of grumbled about it during this uh, 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 series, although not so much because they're doing a good job and it has the heart of Star Wars. But you know, people have always argued in the past against learning too much about Boba Fett and his background and all that things, and I I think they're absolutely wrong. I think that if you if you leave the mystery there, same thing with Doctor, if you leave the mystery there. <coughs> then it becomes very two dimensional because you don't learn anything about your, you know, the person that you're uh, dealing with. And so I think going into this characterization that they have with this Boba Fett, I think is uh, really unique and different. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying the ride. I'm really, I'm really enjoying the exploration of the character, especially with a lot of the kind of how they're doing the flashbacks. Uh, it does feel a little bit like, um, I keep, I keep expecting to have uh, Jeff Goldblum come in. Now you do uh, you do plan on having some Boba Fett uh, in your in your Boba Fett show? Hello. Well, the 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 first the, the first four. Yeah, I thought were that was all Boba Fett. No, it was all did. pretty they Boba did. Fett. That's all, that's all I've been seeing uh, on social media. But, but yeah, that Boba the, Fett oh, in the last two. The last like, two. Okay, I'll yeah. get there. I'll get there. Yeah. Although I, I do have to say, the last two episodes were better than the first four. <laughs> Uh, I would agree. Although I think the first four episodes were amazing, so they were good. They, it just they just keep topping themselves. I think. Yeah, maybe, and maybe that's it. And they, I, I can't wait to see what they do with the finale of tying it all together, especially with what has happened in the final moments of the <laughs> last episode. Yeah, I did. Uh, <laughs> I did see somebody speculate. Yeah, when yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I won't say anymore because that was that was the best surprise ever. Uh, because that one, from the silhouette. that one did not, I did not get spoiled on that one, which I was shocked that I didn't. Um, no, and I, I, I heard somebody talking about that they, they sort of think that the, that the design here might be a um, large uh, scale building towards a Thrawn confrontation. Uh, and building up all these little pieces to it and everybody having to kind of, you know, come together uh, for a, a bigger story with Thrawn, which I, I can kind of see maybe the maneuvering those pieces with Ahsoka uh, because the Ahsoka film's coming out. Obviously, they're, they're, you know, the Obi-Wan uh, series won't have anything. And, and the, uh, oh, who's the guy from Rogue One? And, and, uh, Andor. Andor. Yeah. Andor won't, won't, obviously, because they're... Uh, pieces set in the past but yeah i really wonder if they're kind of maneuvering things for a a more uh crossover uh epic event uh down the road an yeah. avengers style crossover yeah something like it, that it definitely does it definitely does seem like that at the very least it's setting a lot of pieces in place for the main delorean season three so they don't have to spend as much time catching everybody up yeah yeah um, so I did that, and then uh, we watched Tick, Tick, Boom. Oh. Uh, really, really enjoyed that. Uh, I had no idea. In fact, I didn't even know Tick, Tick, Boom had a, until you had you know, obviously had said it uh, last time we talked, but I didn't realize that that was a stage play that he had done before uh, as well that, that they were adapting. So that was, that was a neat surprise. Um, the music is terrific. Andrew Garfield does an amazing job. And thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And then the third thing I did was I basically mainlined Get Back on <laughs> Disney Channel uh, because I thought, okay, I'm going to sit down and do this in little doses, you know, do a, a, an episode and then come back. And, do, and I and I knew that was – I knew I should have just known that I was going to sit down and get so sucked into it. And I did, and the th the biggest thing I take away from it is I am so infuriated on how much Let It Be set a narrative for the 
for that era and that time of the Beatles that is completely falsified and wrong. They, there was not the strife during that, during those sessions that, it's amazing, that, it? yeah, that, that, that let it be painted that picture and, and really kind of drove the entire, uh, story of, of the breakup from there on. Now, granted, this doesn't go up to the breakup. And I really do believe that, uh, the last, uh, straw was Lennon hiring, um, uh, what's the guy without consulting everybody, the, the, they mentioned the guy's name in it, uh, Oh, the Rolling Stones. Yes, guy. yeah. They, but hiring him, I think that was one of the that. I think that certainly led to it. But the the Yoko Ono stuff. I don't believe anybody that said that Yoko was there, uh, disrupting things, and nobody wanted her there because that is not. I mean, he could have left that stuff on the cutting room floor, but in the six plus hours that that is in these films, it's not. It's not there. It's just not there. She was not. I mean, in fact. There are times where they're jamming, where and you know the, the, she does the singing that everybody you know <laughs> points to, and this is oh my god, it's Yoko singing. But it it really was more of a, I mean Yoko's Yoko, but it was more of a kind of a primal just jam thing that even Paul was getting into uh, when they were doing it. And then when Linda brings the her daughter and she's doing the whole you know the the Yoko <laughs> singing as well. I mean it's you could just tell they were having a lot of fun. Yes, there was the tension when they were at um Twinkleham, is it Twinkleham? Is that how you say it? The studio where they were originally going to shoot this thing. And uh yeah, I we all know about the because it, it, the the video was there before where George walks off and and feels like he's, you know, done he's leaving the band all of that's there yes but it doesn't it's the the the, the framing of everything when they finally get you can see the weight lift and the joy come back to everybody when they get to uh not apple uh, to uh abbey road studios with to to em and i and they start actually sitting down and, and playing together you just you see the fun and the joy that was there and it was just it was so refreshing to see all that it was amazing to see uh, witnessing the genesis of Get Back, the song, as as Paul's sitting there, just basically pulling it from his subconscious, just mm-hmm. a creative process that went into that. Um, it was incredible to see Billy Preston show up just to say hi, because, you know, he he knew the guys, and ends up setting in and becoming part of this iconic, you know, well, the, the what ended up being mostly Abbey Road uh, and, and some of what was on the Let It Be uh, album basically being the fifth Beatle. I mean, we knew he was there. We knew that, but you could really kind of see how everybody just, in fact, I think it's when Billy gets on that organ and starts that electric piano and starts playing that they really kind of really get into sync musically. And I think that it's, he's right because Paul was trying to play double duty on that. Once they got Billy in to do all of that stuff, they imagined uh, could be done, and Paul could stay, you know, on on the bass and other instruments. Yeah, you could just really feel it fall together. It was just oh, so good. I I had no idea how much candid moments were captured in that, you know, sixty plus hours of of film. But just to, just to sit there as a Beatles fan and watch all that, just let it kind of just immerse in it and just i i after six hours i wanted even more i wanted more and more and more just to, to, i wanted more of that fly on the wall feel of being there as the creative process was was unfolding it was just it's so amazing i in fact it was one of those things that i thought you know that it, it's six hours that's exhaustive how how could somebody go back and watch this again i'm already ready to go back and watch all six hours of it again it's just it was so that was that good and i am so pleased with peter jackson first time he's ever done anything that was so elongated that i actually love from beginning to end <laughs> so, anyway i i'm done i'm done uh i did uh well the one thing the last thing i'll say is i did think it was funny that paul predicted the myth that yoko broke up the beatles <laughs> <laughs> he says, you know, you know, in in thirty years, somebody's gonna say, you know, Yoko was the reason the Beatles broke up, and it feels so funny. Anyway, I, I'm 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 done. <laughs> so good. This episode of Traveling the Vortex is sponsored by Audible. Audible is the leading provider of audiobooks with thousands of titles to choose from. 
and the catalog includes many of your favorite Doctor Who titles, from novels to novelizations and audio plays to audiobook originals. From new stories to old, you're bound to find something you'll like. And Audible has other science fiction and fantasy titles as well. There's Star Wars, Star Trek, and even audiobooks set in the Marvel Universe. And if you're a fan of the new Dune movie, you can listen to Frank Herbert's original book the film is based on. To sign up for a free one-month trial, just go to audibletrial.com slash travelingthevortex. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash travelingthevortex. Sign up today. Well, should we do some reviews? Let's uh, set it up again, just uh, so the listeners remember. Uh, We're taking a trip through the Time War, and uh, right now we are utilizing a graphic that we found online. And I want to apologize. I I forgot to post it last week, but I have it on our website, and I have it on uh, Facebook now. But it's a terrific graphic that has uh, pretty much... Uh, the time war guiding us through the time war and this is kind of what we're using and i wish i could credit uh who put this graphic together but it's amazing but uh that brings us up to our next set of uh stories in the uh time war prologue uh which are deep time frontier from ravenous three stranded on a desolate world by a dead TARDIS. The Doctor and his friends are trapped, surrounded by creatures from Time Lord Nightmares, the Ravenous. Elsewhere on the edge of the Time Vortex, a Gallifreyan research station takes on board an extremely dangerous artifact. Are the Time Lords sowing the seeds of their own destruction? And if one Ravenous creature rattles the Doctor's nerves, what will happen if the whole clan is hunting him? Well, there's crickets there, Sean. Sean, you want to start? This is um, this is what I was afraid of. <laughs> J- jumping into the middle of, of some of these stories with the 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 the, the time war uh, arc and being thrown into the deep end, as it were, and not knowing any of the characters, getting none of the setup, just you know, Huck, here's the adventure, and uh, learn as you go. Now, not that there's anything wrong with that inherently, and, you know, sometimes it can be fun. But uh, I don't think it did necessarily this story any favors by, you know, what are the ravenous? Well, they're these things. Okay, that's pretty much what you got. You just, they're bad guys, and they 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 eat things. They talk about them ad nauseum enough to give you at least i felt i had enough context to fully understand kind of what they were from the story they they, they were bad things that ate things that's kind of all there was (laughs) they they were they were they were the they were the generic you know they were like bad guys in a marvel movie it didn't matter if they were the robot evil or the alien evil It, it was just something for the avengers to go out and punch in this case, they were things that we needed to run away from. That that was it. And and uh, don't get me wrong, that's all we needed them to be. But I, I had no idea they were they were the boogeymen of Time Lord Legend. Okay. And that was it. That was that was all I got from it. So okay, they're that they're they're that. Well, so I did go on and listen to the rest of the box set, and I get the impression that while we have been told they were boogie Time Lord boogeymen that you really don't delve into kind of their origins and stuff until this box set. Right. Yeah. That was kind of, yeah. And that was a good, in fact, I got the impression and I, I, I've had to have started the next, I haven't gone all the way through, but I've, I've started the next one, but I was also getting kind of the impression that the, this was a um, villain that we sort of back into its story. And I feel like that that's why I don't feel like we were, doing too much of a disservice to ourselves because it really kind of feels like we're backing into the history of this group. And I think that that's what I thought was kind of neat was the fact that they set it up as the boogeyman of Gallifrey lore because it's one of those uh, among many different, and, and yes, it, it is kind of cookie cutter, Sean, but it's among one of the many legendary uh, ancient time uh, uh, villains of the Time Lords, but 
it's another one of those we, we're kind of getting that oh we don't know that much about them this is what we do know where we're going and that's how the story kind of feels is that we're backing into their story we're kind of coming in through the back door of who this you know who they who the ravenous are and what their their motivations are and things and so i thought that was kind of neat the, the way that it was set up and i kind of felt like that we were maybe being groomed into that kind of thing for further stories uh, as we listen to more of this of course now we won't be do- doing any more of this one this one for a while but uh i think eventually we'll, we're going to come back to it and learn a lot more and i think it'll give the the what feels like maybe a two-dimensional uh doctor who villain i think it'll give it maybe a little more meat and unfortunately i felt the same way about the companions uh, I, I felt like we were given just this kind of glossy overview of this particular, you know, companion of the week, which is these are the people that are in danger of being eaten that we don't know much about. And admittedly, again, we're jumping into the middle of this adventure. And, uh, you know, again, that's OK. I, we, I can I can swing with the with the punches here, but I would have liked to have known the stakes a little bit more. Uh, to have felt uh, a, a little bit more attached to these people because at this point the the stakes for them are up here and for me if they get eaten uh, okay I don't really they're, they're, you know I'm not invested enough to to be that concerned if it's yeah. ace I, I'm, I'm I'm worried now, I don't think ace is going to be eaten but I you know there, there's there's a concern level here, so you know I, I I'm not I'm not that invested in the story with these people yet, and so I would have liked to have had that, and I didn't get that just because of where we jumped on at, and so I just it was kind of the same deal. I I, I got a glossing over. These are the, the the principal players and go, and I didn't get it. So as a story, it functions okay. It it does what it needs to do, and it's it's just a you know it's a running about the station and doing its thing, and you know a fairly exciting little adventure. But it just it didn't grab me enough to 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 give me the you know what I needed. I also think it works as a a, a story. I didn't really feel like it had anything to do with the time war, at least where it's at now. Now, again, I reserve rights to change all of this based on when we come back around to A, listening to the rest of the Ravenous stuff and where it's going to fit in with that start segment, and B, where we fit in the, with the rest of the Time War stories and go, ah, okay, this is where this is going to go. I mean, it's it's just a story at this point. So I kind of feel like I don't know that I can really review it beyond the story was okay. I see where you're coming from, and I agree with you. With I think with Liv and Helen, I think we we that's where we have done ourselves a disservice. Uh, Especially in, looking at like the back catalog of stuff yeah, because there Liv there's has a, been Liv is Liv is a lot of uh, well, she's encountered the Seventh Doctor, but the Eighth Doctor she's done she's been with the Eighth Doctor for quite a while. Helen a little less so, but yeah, <laughs> been around for a while. So we have sort of done it a disservice. But I really kind of felt that I learned a lot. In, in two stories about these two uh, ladies. And I actually, I, I, I quite enjoyed it. I don't think that I felt like, yeah, we were kind of thrown in and I, I felt like I was scurrying to catch up to learn who they were, but I thought it was pretty good uh, to address your concern about, I don't know how this is connected to the time or to the time or I don't think any of these pre log stories are necessarily going to have an obvious connection for us other than, uh, in this one, and I wish I could remember what it was, and maybe Keith will help me uh, uh, connect the dots here. But there's the uh, what's his name, the Time Lord that's that's here, uh, um, Rasmus. Yes, Rasmus is using this gal in order to see if they can harvest that. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't Artron energy, but whatever they, they were trying to harvest that energy in order to use as a supplemental fuel for TARDISes because uh, they didn't want to necessarily have to rely on the eye of harmony. And so this was going to be, it's under the guise of a supplemental fuel source 
that they could use, but it's it's alluded to in there at some point that it's the source that they're going to use for the war tardises that yeah, are being tardises. yeah the bat sorry thank you the battle tardises that are being manufactured right now and and the fleet that's being put together so that really is the uh, only that's the only connection of this to that is the fact that that's what they are doing is they are uh harvesting that resource okay i i, I caught that but i didn't make the connection that that dropped line was the the prologue part yeah. of it okay yeah. yeah yeah that's the only thing i noticed that would have fit in with the time war stuff too. That, that's that's thin, and and we're gonna we're gonna find a lot of that. And in fact, Sh- Shadow the Dialogue Dalaks was was kind of the same way. I think there's a, it was a little more heavy handed um, because we knew what the references were there, uh, but they were also pretty. You know, I mean, they were they weren't directly related to uh, what was happening, with the exception of the end when we find out that the the that faction or not that faction, but that group of Daleks and slash collids uh where they're actually that was kind of their their uh counter to the genesis of the daleks uh volley uh so that does connect a little more but yeah i think we're going to find a lot of that in these uh prologue pieces that we're listening to that it's just going to be little nods and things it's going to be a taste of what's to come kind of things fair enough um i like the story a lot i i i i I enjoyed kind of actually enjoyed kind of being tossed into it and feeling a little lost and having to um, catch up. I think Liv and Helen are both to me intriguing uh, characters. They seem Liv and Helen both Liv more so kind of feel like they're uh, probably the the reason why they feel this way. Uh, But they are, they feel like they're already developed. They already feel like they're comfortable. They already feel like they are, uh, very much, they feel like they've been with the doctor for a while and they, they kind of know the routine and we don't have the, the typical companion asking lots of questions. I think Helen asks maybe a few more questions than, than, you know, uh, the average, uh, but it, it just, I kind of feel like they, they really have their, they already have their station. And I think that the, I like that. I like, uh, companions that are kind of already, uh, not they're not themselves not playing catch up either and so that that was cool i liked that about them um i like the intrigue of the ravenous i want to know where we're going with that i want to learn more about the ravenous um and uh oh we just said his name braxel braxel i think he was an intriguing uh character it's a little refreshing to get a time lord that isn't necessarily at least yet necessarily working against the doctor um, he was, but indirectly and, and, and unintentionally at first was working against the, the, what the, you know, the, the, the greater good, uh, but unintentionally, it doesn't really know that, that it's happening. And so it was refreshing to, to find a, or listen to, or hear a time Lord that wasn't butting heads with the doctor the whole time or had nefarious plans or, you know, things like that. So I liked that about it as well. I agree. I kind of kept almost waiting for that yeah. shoe to drop, and Agreed. then it didn't. And it was like, oh, cool. Agreed. And then the fact that he also makes amends with um, with Mr. Ron. Yep. You know, with how he resolves saying, oh, he's going to take her back to Earth and set things right and maybe spend a little time there himself. That, that even more redeemed him with what he had done throughout the story. There was the uh, nice surprise that the Doctor... Uh, thought that this was uh, one person, and it turns out that this is actually the daughter of the person they thought it was, or the granddaughter. Yeah, a daughter, granddaughter, his daughter. Uh, the, the mother of the mother. Person. Oh, his mother. Yeah, you're right. It was the mother of the person that. So it, it's sort of, and in fact, that's the the timey wiminess of it is she she ends up like the, in history. This gal actually disappeared, right? Yeah. 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 So I kind of wonder if maybe there's a hint to something that's happening or maybe her and uh, uh, Rasmus end, or uh, yeah, Rasmus ends up, you know, maybe that's why she disappears because uh, of, of events that, that are that are forthcoming from that. I don't know. Well, I got the impression that he, Rasmus was like, let's go rewrite time. He yeah. Says, yeah. What the heck? Let's rewrite time. That's right. That's something right. along those lines. So I get the, got the impression that while it's not something we knew about previously or would hear about again, it was something that had happened and doctor was aware of. And now that because of this event, time has changed. It's changed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. That makes sense. 
And I like the fact that, you know, the Time Lord also wasn't trying to bring the Ravenous out, that it was an accident. Yeah. And I, I think that's a nice nice added layer of uh, intrigue to it of, oh, this is what's happened and nobody realized where they had been this whole time and now they're out. Um, adds a nice l- level to it. They all say who. Do you collect Doctor Who? Do you have Doctor Who items and you don't know you collect Doctor Who? For all things in the Doctor Who collecting world, tune in to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, a Direction Point Network podcast. I am Larry Van Rusbergen, your host, and I have been collecting Doctor Who for 40 years. With popular features like collection protection and the most outrageous offer, we have a lot of fun. Available anywhere you get your podcasts. You're listening to Traveling the Vortex, a Direction Point Network podcast. Well, let's talk a little bit about the next one, which was Companion Piece. When the evil Time Lord known as the Nine comes across the rare and valuable item floating in the space-time vortex, his acquisitive nature means he can't resist the urge to complete the set. Soon a wicked scheme is underway. Only the Doctor's friends, past, present, and future, will be able to stop him. But without the Doctor around, will even the combined skills of Liv, Helen, Riversong, Bliss, and Charlie be enough to save the day? Bum, bum, bum. Yeah. I had so much fun with this story. I did too. I did too. One of the interesting things about this is the we get, a, we get well, the Nine, yeah, briefly, in the previous story, uh, and they're referring to him as the Eleven. And so there's a right. bit of a timey wimeyness going on here because that incarnation of him is obviously further down in his botched regeneration cycles. Uh, and this is actually an earlier incarnation of him when he's still uh, be re- being referred to as the Nine. So we've encountered the Nine before, though. Because we have. Because we listened to the Legacy of Time. That's And that's correct. the only incarnation of this Time Lord that we've encountered. Right? So far, yeah. And this Other is... Other than the Eleven in the last story. Right. And the Nine, if I if I recall correctly, he was the one that was... Uh, basically, he's, he's a collector. He's... He's stealing. Well, the, yeah, the kleptomaniac, <laughs> uh, and and he was he was uh, stealing things throughout time and and collecting things for his own. Yeah, because it was the fifth Doctor and Jenny against the Nine and Legacy of Time. Yes, I like the. I, I like the river in this story, and the reason I it, it it's interesting to get to that point because River in this one doesn't really feel like she's doing much. She feels like she's being, I mean, as she is, she's she's been captured, um, she's being uh, tortured in order to get information so that he can go collect all these different companions that he's going through and collecting, and it's. You, you're kind of let in on it, or you kind of suspect that River's kind of putting him in, in situations because she's she's basically collecting the necessity that she needs on the on this. Uh, what are we on a space station, or are they on a TARDIS? I don't remember where, he, where they were. They were, on a, they, they were on a space station. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, and so <laughs> she's actually putting the pieces in place in order to thwart him, but that doesn't really come across at first. But they build on that. And I like the fact that it's it's very much revealed that that's been Rivers' uh, intentions the whole time is to put the pieces in place so that they can escape from this. And by picking and choosing, and her, because of her knowledge of of the Doctor's companions, picking and choosing the right ones in order to put them in place. You know, uh, Charlie being the anomaly in time. Um, I think Liv and Helen because of the the well one of their. Uh, um, oh, genius, uh, bliss. Which, if if you feel really lost about bliss, don't because we're going to get actually. That was the other thing that I thought was neat was the fact that she picks bliss and she has bliss go get nine at a time before he she's met the doctor, and so that kind yeah. of puts him on the on his back footing, and it kind of from our perspective of the way we're doing this, we're going, bliss would have already been introduced to us. If we had been listening to the eighth doctor audios, 
in the way I think that I think his Time War stuff came out before. Ra- no, Ravenous came out. Of- so anyway, let's put it this way: we're going to eventually encounter the first uh, the introduction of Bliss down the road here as well. So I thought that was kind of a neat way to give us a companion that wasn't quite yet a companion of the Doctor who doesn't know she's going to be a companion of the Doctor. So the her first appearance did come out before okay. this one did. Okay, okay, that's what so, I thought I'd read yeah. that, but I wasn't sure. But if you're reading in chronological, or if you're listening in chronological order for the Eighth Doctor, you wouldn't know who this person is yet. Right. Obviously. Since we don't. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> I thought it was a really clever story of the river, of river gathering a team together and getting them so they all could escape and how they all worked together and figured out what their strengths were. And it almost had an escape room feel to it since, you know, they're trying to escape a prison anyways, but they all had a certain skill set that they were able to utilize and figure out how they're going to get out and why she picked each one of them. I thought that was really clever. And plus, you know, having river around, always adds a bit of levity and fun to the story. And I thought all the companions bounced off each other really well. And then there's all the fan service. Yeah. (laughs) So much fan service. That was something I went back and forth on as I kept arguing with myself. It was, you know, when's the doctor going to show up and save them? And then it was, no, dude, they don't need the doctor. These are capable individuals. They can do it on their own. Right. How are they going to save themselves? That's the question. I can't wait to see how this transpires. And then they got into it, and it was this amazing, you know, trick of events that allowed them to, you know, and then Rivers, you know, setting them all up to form this team, and how are they going to do it? And how that, you know, played off of each other and, and, and put this together and that they figured it out and it it just was this amazing you know oceans 11 style (laughs) good descriptor yeah yeah Yeah. i mean it 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 was all of the best of the the heist movies and the you know those kinds of things that i love that it was like yes all of the all of the goods of this kind of stuff and um as you were saying, the fan service in it when you when you when you get those moments that you know I, I he he kept the, the the nine kept making these asides and I wondered is like well does he have canine is he is he you know brainwashed somebody is he what was it and then it was excuse me just river <laughs> that he was you know <laughs> oh okay you know but no even that was amazing. With how it was, you know, planned out. And when she turns the tables on him and sends him to a younger version of herself. Right, right. He's like, oh, man. <laughs> well, because he's... Because, he's, because he's, of course she would. He's Well, and the the cool thing about that is he's there to collect somebody else. And it's, it's the body of a companion. And River just happens... She knows that she's there guarding the body or watching over the body at that time. And so to use herself against him and then planting that, well, when he does get, who we, we later find out is Katarina, uh, when, yeah. he, when, he, when he does get her back on there and then her, whatever, it was kind of that weird existential, uh, the art, he tra- reading her Artron, the, the Artron energy that was within her that stayed. And that was ends up what, what thwart, ends up thwarting the nine in that situation and, and resolving that and giving Katarina sort of that redemption arc, a hero story, even after death. I thought that was mm-hmm. really kind of cool. Ali, she tied all of that in together as well. Yeah, there was so much good in this that, m- much like the first one, again, I felt like I had been kind of dropped in the middle of things because we had a little bit more to go on with. We'd been exposed to the villain before, and I was familiar with the companions at least because this was a follow-up. But I I still kind of felt like, oh, once again, we really didn't do ourselves much in the way of favors with this one. But at least, you know, we're somewhat familiar but the story so much more than made up for it yeah. by being over the top with the, the, the fun levels. 
that uh, well, I didn't and mind so much. River and Charlie act as a security blanket for those of us that are fam- yeah. at least familiar enough with those characters, and they have a big enough part in this that we. I think this one is uh, settles a little better because we feel like we know them. And we just yeah. spent a full episode with Liv and Helen, Liv and Helen too, so yeah. they're, they're not as much of strangers. Yeah, they're more familiar to us now. Um, I liked the, uh, I guess you could call them cameos. We had uh, Fraser Hine as Jamie. We had Joe Grant, uh, Katie, Katie, <laughs> Katie Manning. We had uh, Leela, Louise Jameson, uh, Romana, Lala Ward, Adric, Matthew Waterhouse. Uh, and of mm-hmm. course, we had Katarina, which uh, was voiced by um, another actress at this point. And then uh, Margaret. I don't know. Though, have we met Margaret yet? It looks like she. this is the only time she appears. Oh, okay. So this is a companion that we've yet to have. Uh, <laughs> yet to have. That was kind of neat to throw a companion in that we don't. nobody knows. No, no one has ever heard of. Yeah. Right, right. Gives a nice depth of oh look, yeah, there's plenty that we don't know about. And of course, Miss Charlotte Pollard. Yeah. Yes, it was so nice to have her back too. Not missing a step because I think it's been a while since she had done anything, right? Uh, yeah, she's, she's got. Uh, uh, yeah, and in fact, I think even her. Uh, Charlotte Pollard, uh, Charlotte Pollard, uh, something adventurous. I think is even newer than this. So she's. Uh, yeah, and it was, it was nice to have them acknowledge and you know talk about the the whole six doctor thing and making her even more of a, a, a time thing. Yeah. A, yeah. a complex time space events and the fact that he occasionally takes her over to the six doctors corridor and then back and yeah <laughs> it just made me laugh uh-huh. Uh-huh. someday we'll get back to those <laughs> someday someday well any closing thoughts on these uh these two john i i, I completely see where you're coming from with the frustration, especially that first story. Um, but I just, I really kind of feel like this, you and I are getting a dose of what we started this, uh, whole endeavor out with Keith you know, for, yeah, for, for so I, many I years. So <laughs> it's, it's time, of that. time for like, us to, yeah. time for us to get a little taste of our own medicine. I turn, turn about his fair play. That's right. That's right. Which is, I suppose is why I did not have any of the same qualms Sean did. <laughs> <laughs> it's just par for the course. <laughs> I'm experiencing a sensation altogether new to me. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, fellow time travelers, and welcome to the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, the only podcast to discuss, in story order, all the Doctor Who novelizations. My name is Tony Whit, and every two weeks or so, I'm joined by a two- to three-person discussion panel, including our so-called expert who's been a Who fan since 1979. That would be me. We also get the views of intermediate, casual, and novice fans who either have never seen the show or who have never read these books until these podcasts, including Dalton Hughes and Alison Fitzsafried. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you find good podcasts, or even ones like ours. You're listening to Traveling the Vortex, a Direction Point podcast. Well, we have a few more in our uh, prelude version, uh, starting with next week's. Uh, well, Sean, what do we got coming up on the schedule? Well, coming up on the schedule, we are going to be looking on our, uh, our next episode at uh, the War Master box set number two, The Master of Callus, uh, along with a bonus, uh, which will step outside the... Uh, the, the time war for just a moment to look at the recently released uh, Web of Fear, uh, the animated episode three, which of course we've reviewed the the, the Web of Fear is one of our favorites, uh, but they've gone back and animated that missing episode uh, that may or may not be uh, held hostage over in the Middle East somewhere because <laughs> I know Glenn loves to talk about that and I just had to get that dig in. Uh, but, <laughs> They've animated it, so we'll be covering our thoughts on uh, that uh, 
a recently released episode. And then uh, we dip over into the uh, Gallifrey time uh, with uh, the look at uh, the Time War with a couple of stories from that set. So, uh, again, schedule is posted on our website, and you can follow along there as that uh, finishes off the prologue of the Time War. And again, just a reminder, Time Lord Victorious would fall in this uh, line of prologue as well, but we are obviously skipping that for obvious reasons. We've re- re- uh, reviewed those last year, uh, or I guess it's almost been two years now. It's the end of 2020, I believe, when we started that endeavor. So, All right, long, well... Was it that long ago? <laughs> we've also got another project that we're doing um, with uh, some friends of ours over at the Five-ish Fangirl. Sean, you want to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing with them? Well, it's a fun little adventure that we like to call... <laughs> The Oscars. <laughs> it sound like you were channeling uh, John Wayne there for a minute. Yeah, well, it really did. Didn't it? <laughs> well, little lady. Um, it's the Pod versus Pod um, Oscar. What, what, what are we calling this? Pod versus Pod Oscars competition. Pod versus Pod Oscars competition. Thank you. Um, uh, as, as some of you may or may not know, uh, I uh, host Flicks with Friends, uh, which is a, a movie podcast. Uh, and then uh, uh, the five ish uh, fangirls, uh, specifically uh, Rachel, uh, is uh, very, very good friends with uh, Nick, who runs the uh, Gold Standard podcast, uh, where they have been going back and uh, covering all of the uh, Oscar winners throughout history and i've been uh, fortunate enough to be a a guest on that one as well and so all of the uh uh, uh, guests and uh etc on that show are teaming up and we're going head to head uh forming teams to guess the oscar winners which by the way uh well it will be already announced by the time you listen to this but for us it is the oscars uh nominees are being announced tomorrow and so we will uh, be forming teams, and it is uh, the guys here traveling the vortex along with uh, Nick and uh, who's our other teammate? Charles? Is that his name? I've not met Charles yet, uh, but I believe his name is Charles. And uh, against uh, the ladies over at the Five Ish Fangirls. And uh, we will be uh, making our own predictions uh, for the Oscars and then uh, putting forth a team guess and uh, putting those forth and going head to head. And the winners, as far as who gets the most number of guesses correct once the Oscars are broadcast at the uh, tail end of March, uh, gets to make the other team watch a terrible movie of their choice. (laughs) (laughs) Which will be a a lot of fun, and we'll have to discuss uh, what uh, terrible movie we plan to unleash upon the, the ladies should we win. And I will be counting on you guys to make that happen. So. so a lot of good, a lot of good fun, and we're going to we'll keep you updated on uh, how that's going. Uh, when we, I think we're going to uh, mention nominees. We might talk even a little bit next week, a little bit about the the movies and the nominees. Nothing that we're going to deviate too much from uh, our Doctor Who stuff, but we may uh, make a little mention. But we'll we'll keep you updated and keep you apprised uh, as we head into Oscars and, and let you know how this competition goes. All right. Looking well, to me too. Be sure to yeah, check out. Be, fun. be sure to check out our website, travelthevortex.com, for updates on this podcast. And if you get any value out of the podcast, why not consider putting some value back into it? You can do that by uh, clicking on that patron link on our website. Consider supporting us. Thank you for those who already are. We appreciate it so much. Also, please consider giving us a five star review wherever you subscribe to the podcast. It helps bump us up in those ratings and recommendations. And then make sure you join in the conversation on our listeners forum on Facebook. Anything else we need to uh, talk about before we close this show? If not, until next time, I'm Glenn. I'm Sean. I'm Keith. Cheers. Good night, everybody. Be seeing you. Thanks for listening. You have been listening to Traveling the Vortex. Doctor Who and all of its associated programs are owned and trademarked by the BBC. 
No infringement is intended or implied. Direction point! Direction point! A Doctor Who Podcast Network.